All right, welcome back. So let's talk about some, a few, just a few features of uh, this this glacial events during the ice ages that um, were, created some things that we probably can recognize today. So Cape Cod is one of them. Cape Cod is in Massachusetts. It's this very distinctive landform that kind of sticks out, extend this arm that kind of rotates and sticks up out in the uh, Atlantic Ocean. Um, there's some fancy islands where fancy people live, uh, Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket Island, uh, as well in this, this area. And, and all of these landforms uh, owe their existence to uh, sediment that was deposited during some of the Pleistocene glaciations. Um, so this is Cape Cod. This is that arm that stick out from Massachusetts. Um, here's Plymouth, as in Plymouth Rock. Um, but... So Cape Cod and then Martha's Vineyard and, and Nantucket, these fancy little, little islands, all right? So during some of the Pleistocene glaciation, you had glaciers moving that far south. Um, we had terminal moraines deposited at the end. And then as the glacier recessed, had a little pause. So we had a recessional moraine where more sediment was deposited. Now, I want you to, to keep an eye on the shape of this, this, and this terminal moraine section, and then this recessional moraine um, section, all right? I'm going to overlay Cape Cod right on top of it, all right? So this arm of Cape Cod is created because of the recessional moraine deposit, and then Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard are actually terminal moraine deposits. That's why those islands are there. Now, they've been shaped by water and the ocean and, and the climate, you know, for a while, but their initial deposits are there because of, um, of glaciers. Another cool little interesting uh, byproduct of glaciation was uh, something called the um, Bering Land Bridge. Uh, and that's because, again, as glaciers and ice is created, you know, you've you got to get those, the water that makes those up has to come from somewhere, right? So you're taking water out of the ocean into the atmosphere and then onto these glaciers. So sea levels are dropping. So large areas of today's continental shelves were exposed uh, and then quickly blanketed by vegetation because there wasn't enough water in the ocean to cover them. The Bering Strait, which is the area between um, Alaska and Russia, there's a, a small little um, uh, strip of ocean now called the, the Bering Strait. Well, with, no, with lower sea levels, the ground was exposed. And so the Bering Strait actually connected Alaska and Siberia, that part of Russia, with a, a broad land bridge, which um, humans and various animals migrated and made their way to North America. That's how humans got to North America, was thought, along this land bridge. Uh, because remember, um, humans uh, evolved out of Africa, spread into Europe, into Asia, and then followed the land bridge uh, into North and South America. It's thought. Um, so during the Pleistocene, and the reason for this uh, is because the, during the Pleistocene, sea levels were as much as 425 feet lower than what they are now. And so that Bering uh, land bridge uh, was that Bering Strait land bridge connected Asia to North America. So um, all of this is currently underwater, but with sea levels dropping, all of that was exposed. And so now humans and animals could make their way into North America. Here's North America now. Let's keep an eyeball on this area up here. And here's what it would have looked like in glaciation. That would have been a land bridge. Right? That would have been a land bridge. People, animals would have been able to um, make their way. So then the idea is, well, how did they get down here if this was all ice? Good question. I don't know. Maybe they stood up here for a while until things melted and then made their way uh, down into the Americas. All right, uh, another fun little outcome of the glaciation was the Great Lakes, the five Great Lakes. I'm from Cleveland. I used to live along the shores of Lake Erie. Love the Great Lakes. Um, before uh, the Pleistocene, before all this uh, glacial activity, the Great Lakes region was more just a flat sediment deposited broad plain, had some streams and stuff, but there was no lakes there. As these massive two mile thick 
glaciers, continental glaciers, kind of move southward from Canada covering the area, those glaciers also can carve just deep gouges into, uh, into the crust. Um, into the lithosphere and that's kind of what they did in these certain areas they really gouged out deep these areas that would later be filled with melting water as the the uh, glacier uh, recessed so by about 14,000 years ago uh, after the <clears throat> excuse me the um, glaciers had begun to recess part of Lake Michigan and Lake Erie basins were ice free glacier melt water began forming the the initial lakes there it's not still glacial water. This happened 14,000 years ago. It's not, it, the glacier carved it out. It's just filled with water now. It's not still glacial water. Um, yeah, as the ice continued to retreat, it continued to expose more of the, uh, of, of the Great Lakes. So again, so about 14,000 years ago, um, the lakes were starting to be um, exposed. So Lake Erie, uh, here, Lake Michigan. Um, then again, as the uh, ice further retreated, and then yeah, the what you see in the dash line. This is still six thousand years ago. What you see in the dash line is the the current makeup of the of the Great Lakes. But yeah, all of those were kind of carved and gouged out initially by those massive glaciers, and then water just kind of filled them in into these deep basins. One more little thing that uh, most people have never heard about, um, besides these larger glaciation during the Ice Age of the Pleistocene, is actually something called the Little Ice Age. The most recent glacial expansion called the Little Ice Age actually occurred not but uh, 500 to, um, it should be about 200 to 500 years ago. And it's called the Little Ice Age. It occurred between the 15 and 1800s. During the um, during the Little Ice Age, glaciers expanded more so in the northern latitudes, like in Iceland. They didn't really reach down into uh, deep into North America, but the glacial st the glaciers still expanded in in the northern regions of Earth. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and yeah, so certain so that made certain climate that means certain climates were cooler. So if you lived in a little bit more northern uh, latitudes, like say in 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 Europe and England and Sweden and Finland, then rivers and canals would regularly freeze over. It'd be, you know, the climate's different, so it's a little bit cooler. So it wasn't a full ice age glaciation, just a little bit, right? So the winter was a little bit cooler. Summer is a little bit cooler. Um, in fact, it's seen in artwork. Um, so this is the, the River Thames um, in, uh, in England. And they're kind of carving out ice here and having fun and doing things on this frozen river. That never happens now. That It never freezes now. It just doesn't happen. But during a little ice age from the 1500s to 1800s, the climate was a little bit cooler. This happened. Um, the greatest effect, again, on humans came from the cooler, wetter summers and then shorter growing seasons. This becomes super important. Because it was a little bit cooler in Europe, you had shorter growing seasons, which resulted in famines. Because if you have shorter growing seasons for crops, you're not going to be able to produce as much crops, as big of crops either. So you're not going to be able to feed a population. Less crops, smaller crops, that means people are going to starve. So famine occurred. That's what aided so many Europeans coming to North America, was the Little Ice Age. Look at that geology. So many people, you know, started to flock here um, in from the 1500s on, on up because of this little ice age. It was too cold. Growing season wasn't enough. wasn't enough food. Hey, let's go to North America. At least it's a little warmer there. We can grow stuff. That's why they came because the little ice age. Uh, for example, in England, the growing season was five weeks shorter from 1680 to 1730 as an example, or right in the middle of this um, little ice age. Five weeks is a lot. If you ever try to grow anything, five weeks is, makes a heck of a difference. If we look at um, global averages uh, going back to the year zero, um, you know, there's natural fluctuations in, in temperatures. Um, and then what we start to see here, let me move me a little bit, let me move me up here. From again around the 1500s to the 1800s, we see the temperature dip just a little bit, just enough to create a little ice age. And in fact, we should still be there now. 
The reason it stopped in the 1800s is that's when the Industrial Revolution took hold. We figured out how to utilize coal and, and other fossil fuels and started burning them, pumping carbon into the atmosphere, starting to change the atmosphere right away. And since that, since that point, since the Industrial Revolution, look how the global average temperature just shot up. We should be, in fact, so if you can kind of see, I'm going to be dramatic here, but this whole period here is actually arched up like this. Again, I'm being a little bit dramatic, but you can kind of imagine from here, kind of up in the middle here, and then back down here. So there is kind of an arch to it. So that's how long that these natural cycles usually go for. So you can imagine that same length, but down here. In fact, I've run out of screen. So from this point, you know, it should be coming down, should be coming down, should be coming down. We should still be in the cooling period. We should still be in the Little Ice Age. But thanks to the Industrial Revolution, that brought us out of it. And that's what continues to heat the planet. And that's probably what's going to make And I don't, <laughs> this is not a conspiracy theory. There's no such thing. Um, you're not going to hear this probably from too many people. But I give humanity on our, our current path. I don't know. 100, 200 years maybe? That's about it. That's about it. On our current path. We change things. Yeah. It's the reality of things. Good times, isn't it? Well, in any case, let's pause there. So that kind of ends our geologic talk of, oh my gosh, the Earth and some highlights from beginning to end. Um, we'll ha we still have one more section to go. Uh, we'll talk about some of the Mesozoic mineral deposits, and that'll be our last section uh, of the Cenozoic. I'll see you back here in just a second. <laughs>